At AB InBev, we always dream big. It's our culture and our heritage. But more than that, it's our future. A future where we always look forward, always serve up new ways to meet life's moments. A future where we keep dreaming bigger. To provide opportunity for our people, lift up our neighbors, and make a meaningful impact in the world. A future that everyone can celebrate and everyone can share. A future with more cheers. and welcome to day three of the EFMD Global Fairs by Hired. My name is Amber Wigmer Alvarez, Chief Talent Officer of Hired, and it's a great pleasure to moderate this session today with Maria Degener from AB InBev. Please allow me to introduce you to Maria, then we'll be bringing her on for the show. I have a number of questions, but I strongly encourage you to share your questions as well, which I will be fielding to her throughout the session. So Maria is the Brewery Operations Director for the Business Unit Central Europe for Anheuser-Busch InBev, the leading global brewer with approximately 164,000 colleagues around the world in nearly 50 countries worldwide and over 500 brands, including Budweiser, Corona, Stella Artois. She is responsible for AB InBev's breweries in Germany with a talented team that is 1,800 strong, brewing the highest quality beer day in and day out. She joined AB InBev as a global management trainee in 2009, and then went on to hold brewery optimization and packaging management roles at the Bex Brewery in Bremen, Germany, and later at the company's Los Angeles Budweiser Brewery. In 2016, Maria moved to New York and led internal communications through the company's historic combination with Saab Miller, and then took over the role of Global People Director for Supply and Logistics before assuming her current role. Maria holds a bachelor's degree in mass communications from the University of California, Berkeley. A warm welcome to Maria. Hi, Amber, Hello. and uh, thank you so much for having me today. Very excited. Always good to, uh, you know, talk to future talents and, and share a little bit on, on what we're doing. So thank, thank you. you so much for being here. Your generosity and the talent has been engaging very actively throughout the fair so far with your colleagues back in the virtual stand. And I'll just remind them to head on over back to the stand immediately following this session. We also have Maria's colleague Medina in the chat. So any specific questions that come up about opportunities and processes, Medina is happy to take those and more strategic questions and, and specific questions directed to Maria. I look forward to seeing them in the chat and, and asking Maria. But first to set the scene, I would like to just ask you for your pitch. We often talk about a career pitch, elevator pitch. I'm just hoping you could give us a bit of your professional journey. How has it been, Maria? Well, um, you summarized at high level. Um, so it's it's certainly been a bit of an unusual journey. Um, and I think uh, as a company, we're we're kind of known for stretching people way beyond their their normal scope. Um, but I've done some of the more extreme cross-functional moves. Um, so, as you said, I, I started out as a trainee, so we have a variety of different trainee programs. Um, and we had just launched that in Germany at the time, a couple of years before, so I was a class of 2009. And um, as you said, my, my degree was a, a bachelor's degree at, in mass communications from Berkeley. So I was not an engineer, but the uh, program exposed me to both or, you know, most of the, the areas within the business. So operations um, in the breweries and, and logistics, as well as commercial. And I just fell in love with supply. Loved it. Um, so decided to, to be open despite a non-engineering background and pursuing a career there. And yeah, I was able to do that for, I think, you know, out of the almost 13 years uh, with, with ABI, I've done, uh, you know, 
nine in uh, in supply and and logistics and uh, it's been fantastic um, and there's been a lot of different types of experiences which i'm happy to to elaborate on sure and how did you think about the opportunities you wanted to engage in in the type of work yeah i think um that has evolved um i don't think it was as conscious in the beginning um you know i had i was always lucky to have mentors or people who cared about my career who who helped me in, in making decisions but looking back um you know all my different roles um brought different career experiences that helped me grow as a person and that allowed me to take on the path that i you know in the end was able to take so now, when I talk to young talents in our organization, I really, really emphasize this, this need to look at career experiences. Let me give you an example, right? So one of the career, the, the most basic ones as a leader is leadership experience, right? And I classify them in, in three, di three different levels. So one is, you know, I have a team that reports to me. So I'm a, I'm a team leader. The next stage, which is very different in terms of the capability and the, and the skills you need to develop is being a leader of leaders, right? So now I don't directly, you know, coach or influence that, that front line. I need my leaders and I need to coach them on how to be leaders. So it really changes your perspective. Um, I've had roles as an individual contributor. So I was a team of one, right? And so what you learn there is how to have impact and influence, how to impact indirectly. I can't tell somebody what they need to do, right? I'm not the boss. So how do I get buy-in? How do I you know, convince people that what I'm trying to do is, is the right thing to do? So two very different career experiences, right? Um, another one is ways of working getting to know your company, right? So we have a very specific way of running our day-to-day -day operations in supply. We have a management system. I had experiences in that in, in one of my first roles. Um, managing budgets of different growth, right, is, a, is an important career experience. Um, working international. So I had the chance to work in global for, for four or five years. So I worked with, you know, all different countries and cultures around the world. You learn a lot about yourself, your own culture, how you come across, how you need to adjust styles. So these are some of the career experiences that I put more emphasis and, and conscious thought on now than uh, what I did in the beginning of my career. You've already had quite a journey. We have a question from the audience. What yes. do you like most about working at ABM, Beth? It's an easy one, it's the people. Um, I, I love working with, with our colleagues. Um, I think we have a culture of, of very, you know, informal ways of interacting. Um, you know, it's, uh, I try to be as available to, to my entire organization as much as possible. Anybody can talk to me anytime. You don't need to go to, you know, a, a secretary and, and set an appointment or, or you know, there, there is very few layers and, and very high interactions. Um, so I love that. Um, meritocracy is, is closely tied to that, right? So it's not necessarily a matter of how much, you know, time and role. And then after three years, you get automatically, you know, to the next layer or something. It's, it's really about what you bring, your results, um, how you develop people, how you build your team. And uh, I've, I've loved that from the beginning. Excellent. Maria, another question from the audience. Yes. This, this hits close to home, pivoting careers. Could you please explain a little about how you kept up with the changing skill set required for these roles, which weren't in your educational background? Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and it's it's interesting because that's something we look for. I'm not saying I'm the standard, but, you know, I love to learn. So being curious, being open, um, being humble helps. Um, so it's actually very generic things, right? Lo knowing what you don't know. And then... Um, working with the people who have that information and, and really listening. So it was almost an advantage sometimes. Like, I'll give you a simple example early in my career, not being an engineer, right? I didn't have a deep technical education. My team knew 100% what they were doing. So I didn't have the luxury to sit in my office and make decisions. I had to go, you know, if we had a broken machine, talk to my team find out what's their recommendation. It, it, they felt like they were being listened to, they had a say, they could be part of the decision. 
I was ultimately accountable for whatever I decided and I made plenty of mistakes. Don't get me wrong. Um, but you know, that that's something that you have to be willing to do. So you have to admit what you don't know. You have to go listen and be open and curious and learn. So I think those are relatively generic skills um, to, to, to enable some of that and a lot of support, huh? Like, you know, you, you have people who support you to, throughout those transitions and help you um, what you don't know, which uh, the teams and, and their diversity uh, plays, a, plays a big role in that. So you've already mentioned now twice, having a mentor and people that mm -hmm. support you. Can mm -hmm. you talk a bit about your mentor and who you turn to when you have these setbacks and challenges in your career? Yes, um, it's it's not been one person. I think uh, mentors change um, and relationships change, right? Um, I've been very fortunate that it's been a combination of um, people who, you know, we have a formal mentoring program where you can get matched. Um, but there's obviously, you know, I've gone to people and I said, hey, I'd be interested. You know, do you have time? Um, so, so those people have changed. And um, for me personally, it's been um, people within the function. So I've had mentors within supply who understand what I'm doing. And then sometimes that outside perspective, people who really mentor you based on a completely different set of experience that has nothing to do with your function to give you different perspectives. Um, but it's also been outside of the company. Yeah? So I have uh, the, the luxury that, um, you know, some people in my family also have had very good, interesting careers. Uh, so I found certainly very good advice uh, there and uh, other people from other companies. So, um, you know, I, I try to always, it's not intentional, maybe it should be a little bit more intentional, but to have a, a bit of a spectrum of, of mentorship. Excellent. Now, a great question from the audience about what do the most successful new hires do in their first month at ABM Bev? And is there a common factor? Do they have something there in common amongst those top performers? Um, well, I think you need to need to distinguish a little bit between um, new hires, let's say, with experience and people coming from university, varying degrees, right? Whether it's undergrad, graduate school, um, doesn't doesn't matter. So if you end up joining through one of our programs, the global management trainee program or the supply management trainee or the commercial trainee. Pro There's, you know, so many different programs that we have. That experience in the beginning is invaluable for a later career because you get to really um, get to know the front line, whether that's in, in, you know, whatever area that is, whether that's in supply or commercial. And that is, is so valuable to really make give you a different decision making framework in, in, in later career stages, building relationships, right? Like if you end up making, I don't know, operational decisions later and you still have that frontline person that you first met and you can call them up, it's like, hey, we're thinking, right? Like the, the input you can get is, is variable, uh, va incredibly valuable. So asking a lot of questions, um, getting your hands dirty, right? It, it might not be what you wanna do for the rest of your life, but that first experience that I got as a, as a frontline leader in supply is one of the key reasons that I got to have this role now. And it sometimes sucked. I worked shift. Eh? Like you don't always get to have the, you know, um, working shift for three years was one of the hardest things I've done. Um, but it, it's, it's an experience. If you stick with that, if you're resilient, if you are curious and you ask a lot of questions during that time, it can really catapult you later in your career. You hear it out there in the audience. Curiosity has also come up a couple of times. Yes. Another question. Our audience is very active and I encourage them to keep the questions coming. Yes. Uh, question. Many applicants are expected to have a set of skills that directly correlates with the position being applied for. But in your case, it is different. At what rate would you say the opportunity you had before entering AB InBev is available to others out there? Um, I think... Uh... You know, it's, I don't want to make it seem like I didn't have to have certain skills, right? So we, we test quite a bit for like logical reasoning, analytical skills, um, problem solving skills. So, um, you know, I think uh, 
if I made it sound like none of my skills matched, right? Like that's that's not a hundred percent, not a hundred percent accurate. Um, I was able to build certain skills that ended up becoming relevant later through throughout that position. But let me read the question. Should I make sure? Many of my case is different. Yeah, I think it's a it's a mix, right? And I do believe that um, that is a little bit of a of a unique. Um, I think uh, positioning that that ABI has has developed um, to allow people to to grow beyond their scope. I do believe that's really something that sets us apart from a little bit uh, from from other companies. And a question from Emma: uh, What does the day to day look like in the area of supply? Oof, um, it's interesting. So when you produce. Um, as much beer, if you make as much beer as, as we do um, every day, one of the big challenges is that you have to do it in the same high quality, the same taste, um, and ideally with, with you know, higher and higher output um, at all times. So you, there is a portion that's highly standardized, okay? Nevertheless, um, and, and my team and I joke about it, like we do, we have some things that we deal with on a day to day basis, we would have never thought come across our desks. Um, I mean, not to I think the, the topic, nobody wants to talk about it, but COVID was a huge challenge. And, you know, we ended up being almost like health managers and, uh, you know, had to do things we never thought we had to do that uh, certainly make for a big variety in our days. Uh, we set up a vaccination center, like dealing with people, you know, answering questions, um, dealing with a lot of fears and anxiety, right? Like what we needed to do on a day-to-day -day basis became suddenly something completely different. Um, but maybe giving some specific examples. So there's uh, routine meetings you have every day uh, where you discuss performance, right, um, on, in a variety of different things, safety, quality, performance. Um, a lot of time is people management. So, you know, you, you saw my team is uh, 1,800 people strong. So you can imagine that um, whether it's performance management, whether it's feedback, coaching, conversations, that takes up a lot of the day. Um, so I think those are some some concrete examples on, on content and, and what I actually spent time on every day. Very good. Now, I was going to be asking you about corporate culture and how a yes. lot of our talent look for a brand or a specific company objective, but I'm going to combine it with a question that we have from the audience around the company's values. What are AB InBev's values and what characteristics would you look for in employees in order to represent those values? Okay. Um, so we actually, if, if anybody has a chance to take a look at our, our website, um, we have it very well defined um, what our culture is. Um, so we have, you know, our 10 principles that lay out who we are, what we believe in and, and how we want to work. Um, let me cluster it in, in, in three pieces. I think the, the first one is a strong belief. And, and I don't know if, you know, we played it at the very beginning, uh, if people got a chance to saw our, our company video, but dreaming big is something that we've always done and that we really believe in. What does that mean? Dreaming big, right? So it means setting really high goals, things that seemingly are unattainable and, and then reaching for that. Um, and that can be in a, in a small scale in your day-to-day -day job, right? Really stretching your target, stretching your team, what you want to achieve. And uh, that can also translate into what we are trying to do as a company. So it, can, it doesn't mean it has to be huge, but it, it, it's, it's that stretch factor that we're trying to apply to, to everything that we do. The second piece is people. And that's around our principle two and three. So we have a, a strong belief, as I said earlier, in, in that people are, are you know, our greatest asset and we have to spend a lot of time and care in developing our teams. With that comes uh, you know, a strong drive for, for diversity and inclusion. I'm happy to talk more about that. That's a you know, hot topic everywhere in the world and it has been for a while. Um, with that comes the belief that, you know, you are promoted and, and you are gr you're, you're growing at the pace of your talent. So it's not about time and position. I mentioned that earlier. Uh, it's about meritocracy so that you are promoted based on your results um, and that you really need to pay a lot of attention to your team. So we promote also based on developing people that are better than yourselves. 
So it's not, you know, you really want that. You actually, if you have a lot of people that could take your job, that's a good reflection on, on you as a manager. And then the, the rest of our culture is really defined in what we believe in. So we do have, um, you know, a, a culture of, of excellence, of, of discipline, simplicity, um, of tight cost management. So we can reinvest that. Uh, we're, we're known for that as a company. It's a key strength. Um, a, an ethical way of working, no shortcuts. So, you know, I'm, I'm throwing out these, these buzzwords a little bit, but this is something that you really are, are measured against uh, in your performance and how we... Um, assess people how we develop people so it's woven through you know the fabric on how how we operate as a company excellent and you talked about the meritocracy a question from amir around what you're talking about the promotion internal promotion asking about career evolution what is possible and the speed of that evolution at ab and bev yeah i think um speed is uh, it, it can go very fast um, I would say we've almost gone a little bit too fast at times. So this is something that we're also looking at right now. And it comes back a little bit to um, what I mentioned earlier with career experiences, right? So I think it's important to spend time thinking about that, right? Figuring out where do I want to be in five to 10 years? What kind of career experiences do I need to get there? And I don't have to have all the answers, right? These are conversations I, I can be having with my, my boss, my boss's boss, a mentor. There's different ways to, to identify that. Some career expenses are also clearly defined in career path and our people team or sorry, HR, right? We call HR our people team. Um, so to, to do that. So I, for example, have done a variety of lateral moves in the beginning. So lateral move meaning at the same level. And then it ended up giving me a breadth of experience and, and some um, maturity, I would say, that ended up getting me very quickly two steps up. And then again, there was a flattening out. So it, it depends a little bit what you want to do, um, but it can go extremely fast. Excellent. Now, we've had a number of questions throughout this fair about remote opportunities. We know that more than 80% of our talent are looking at remote opportunities. Can you talk about how remote work has affected the AB and BEV culture? And I imagine perhaps not so applicable in the area of supply chain, but I'd like to hear your insights on that. Yes. Um, so yeah, my team uh, consists mostly of people who have to come to the brewery every day because we have to brew our beer, we have to package it, we have to make sure, you know, it's in good quality, et cetera. Um, we have to drive it to our customers. So those are not jobs that allow for remote. Um, and, uh, you know, that's uh, for, for sometimes good to keep in mind. Some people don't have that option. Um, having said that, of course, it's, it's a topic that we discuss a lot. And um, what we do as a company is... Uh, there's always going to be a part that is going to be where you have to come to the office because, you know, I've, I've talked a lot about culture. I've talked a lot about growth and, and sharing of experiences that happens in person. Nevertheless, there is remote opportunities and I have plenty of people who work remote regularly in my team. What I'm really trying to drive, and I think this is important, is what do you have to do in your job? If I have 10 hours of Zoom meetings, I don't need to come to the office. I can do that anywhere. If I need to problem solve, if I need to team build, then that's something done in person, right? So I think what I'm really trying to drive in my team is like, what is it that you need to achieve? What's your current objective? And, you know, that can change, right? And, and what is necessary for you to be able to be successful in that? And it could be very much that you're remote certain weeks, right? Like, and, and that's a, a line manager and manager and, and direct report conversation. Like I, my team doesn't need to ask me for permission if they're going to work from for, at home for a day or two, you know, it doesn't like, maybe I, I'll, I'd like to know, but like, there is no conversation about that, but that's a bit of a, a, a line manager direct report agreement that everybody has to, has to have. Your approach makes so much sense. Now we have questions around diversity and inclusion, but okay. before I ask you the question from the audience, why don't we take a look at a video sure. from AB and Bev on diversity and inclusion.
At AB InBev, we always dream big. It's our culture and our heritage. But more than that, it's our our purpose is to create a future with more cheers by Our purpose is to create a future with more cheers by building the most effective, engaging and inclusive organization. In 2021, we accomplished great things for diversity and inclusion together. We defined a comprehensive DNI strategy, which included our new European Diversity and Inclusion Council focused on four major pillars. Each squad is led by an executive sponsor and a dedicated team of change agents. We focused on initiatives that can help us attract, develop, and retain diverse talents creating powerful community partnerships for underrepresented groups to inject diverse talent into the organization. We enhanced our parental leave policy in Europe. Regardless of the gender of the parents, whether the child is welcomed by birth, adoption, or surrogacy, we increased the parental paid leave for caregivers. To offer flexibility, we also introduced a return to work program. Together, we achieved great things through integrating DNI in our business strategy. Two initiatives we are proud of are our anti-harassment and anti-discrimination initiative and our physical inclusion initiative. We partnered with our sales directors in assessing how inclusive the work environment is for our frontline sales teams. An internal code of conduct was created and we organized training and local campaigns. Our facilities in Europe were assessed and we developed a clear roadmap to make them more inclusive and accessible to everyone. Our greatest strength is our people, and we support every individual to excel. We strive to be an inclusive workplace with equal opportunity. In 2022, we will have an increased focus on anti-harassment and anti-discrimination. We aim to make our company as diverse as the communities we serve. We want to show not just tell our DNI journey. DNI is in the DNA of our culture. A culture will be shining a light on in our upcoming campaigns. We dream bigger and better when we are together. We have piloted a cooperation with the Brewers of Europe with the clear goal of establishing a pan-European code of conduct together. As owners, we are all responsible for DNI. Everyone in our company has the responsibility to champion an equitable workplace. What will our colleagues be committing to in 2022? To continue our efforts against discrimination and harassment. To encourage women leadership. To harness the ideas of all our people. Run inclusive meetings. Supply chain DNI. Build empathy. Gender diversity in sales. Excellent video. Congratulations on those initiatives, Maria and ABN and Bev. Do you want to put into your own words the, a response to the question we have from the audience, the values around diversity? Yeah, I think a lot of them were already in, in, the, in the video, right? Uh, it's really about equity and equality. Um, and I think um, the, the biggest thing which... I would highlight, as uh, you know, you saw the the European DNI Council. I'm I'm part of that um, council, and I I work on the on the workplace uh, piece because you saw like our breweries are, are a big portion of that. So, is is making sure that you know the only way to achieve diversity and, and inclusion, and I'm, I'm I'm emphasizing inclusion is if it's not a just just a, a leadership driven you know and, and seen as an initiative it has to be lived and and held accountable for on on every level in the in the organization right um it's not something that i can achieve without my team and i don't i mean every person right 1800 people have to understand why it's important how we can get there and what their personal responsibility in it is. Um, so I think that's 
that's the journey, right? Um, and that's the journey. It's not something you achieve over day. Um, and that's what, what I'm really putting my focus on. Um, and some things can only come from leadership, but there is a big responsibility on everyone, particularly in how we treat each other, right? Um, and being aware of things that are not inclusive and that don't help drive diversity um, to, to help people unlearn certain habits and learn new ones, which is, uh, which is always uh, a challenge, right? Learning something new is easier than unlearning something um, so, so that's, that's the journey that we're on in my very, own world. Very well stated. And would you say that this applies on a global basis in the 50 countries? What are you doing to expand the DNI efforts internationally? Is this happening in, given that diversity and inclusion means different things in different countries, how yes. are you ensuring that this is being applied all over the globe? So um, the, what you saw for Europe uh, started years ago in a, in a framework in, in global, right? So um, it started with a clear commitment from our you know, CEO and, and our senior leadership team. And then it, it cascaded down and, and there is a clear framework that we've established, right, on how we uh, think about diversity and inclusion, what it means for us. So our, our diversity and inclusion commitment, which is all public at this point, right? Um, and it, it means um, a way of working. So, and, and that's replicated around the, the world. So the DNI Council that we have in Europe exists in global, but it also exists in Asia Pacific, it exists in North America, it exists in South America. And a big portion, which I think is a bit of a, a, you know, something that's inherent in our culture is best practice sharing. So whatever we see come out of the work of a local council, let's say in Peru, might very well make it onto my desk in Germany. And then you have to see what's applicable, right? So is it or is it not applicable to what the hot topic is in, in that country. To, I mean, to your point, right? The issues might be very different. Very good. Now we have a number of questions coming in from the audience. So I'm gonna go back to those. Would you say AB InBev fosters entrepreneurial minds in the company? And if so, are there any support mechanisms? Uh, yes, it's a it's a big part of it. Um, and I think, uh, you know, we have um, something that's called uh, ZX Ventures within our organization. And uh, that was actually built years ago to to really bring in that entrepreneurial mindset. The, the original mission of, of that group was to disrupt ourselves. Yeah. Um, so and, and for that, we had to change who we hire, right? Like we didn't necessarily have that mindset um, or we, we did, but we needed to find different ways to identify and, and bring those people in. And that really triggered something that I think is now living across um, across our organization. So it's, it's not just that ZX Ventures arm that it still exists in, in ABI, it has spread. And, and what we have that is driving everything I've talked about from our culture that we're living it, right? To DNI, um, to an entrepreneurial mindset. All of these things constantly have an impact on how we define leadership capabilities and which ones we want to more emphasize based on what our strategy is requiring us to do, right? To evolve as a company. So um, having that entrepreneurial mindset, um, you know, being curious, failing support mechanisms, I think, uh, you know, and that's also part of, of um, like a, uh, a fearless organization, right, and which I always talk a lot about when it comes to, to inclusion. You need to allow people to, to make mistakes, learn from them, share their learning so other people can learn from that, other people can learn from that. So this is a, a mechanism that I believe uh, supports that. Excellent. Thank you. Now, a question from the audience. Really great to learn about the company and how much priority the company pays to talent development. How could you describe the ideal candidate for AB InBev? Um, so I think um, when we talk about our, our culture, that's what uh, is, is kind of a, a shared belief, right? So if you like to you know, dream big. So have, if you already set, set yourself stretch goals, if that's something that you find, you know, you get, you get easily bored, you're curious. I've, I've mentioned that so many times, right? Um, I think that's already there and don't get me wrong, right? So just because we, we have shared values doesn't mean we're all the same. 
that's that's the opposite of diversity, right? So um, a strong company culture doesn't mean, um, you know, we're all thinking the same way or we're all the same people, not at all. But these are some things that we believe are important and, and that needs to be a match. Um, problem solving is no matter where you are, something where every day we, we you know, uh, solve problems. And then if you happen to like beer, I think that's a, that's a good bonus, you know, passion for, for the, for the product is certainly something that combines this as well. Now you probably haven't had an interview potentially since 2009, maybe internally, but we do have a classic interview question coming from the audience. What would okay. you describe as your greatest strength and weakness? <laughs> oh, trust me, I've had interviews and, uh, <laughs> The strength and weaknesses is a is a constant conversation. Um, let me start with the weakness. Um, patience is is something that I I continuously have to work on. Um, you know, and and patience in in terms of progress. Um, you know, or listening. Like I I've been working on my my listening skills. I do listen, but it doesn't always come across like that. So, <laughs> you know, those are important, important attributes to bring. So um, I think I, I'm continuously working on, on, on those two. Um, my strength is um, my, definitely my, my, my leadership style, I believe. Uh, it's an empathetic one. Um, so I, I believe I understand my role very well in unblocking my team so that they can grow and be and, and deliver what they need to do. Excellent, Maria. And now a question about the challenges you encounter the most on the floor working with direct university recruits. And what are your recommendations to universities to help them produce a better next wave of talent? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, what do I most encounter? So I think it's a little bit, uh, it's the patience as well, right? So everybody wants to grow fast and, and uh, you know, have exciting projects that, uh, you know, are exciting all the time. But that's not how the real world is, right? So yes, we're extremely fast pacing. Um, yes, the world is constantly changing. But I think particularly in the, in the beginning, you need to learn resilience, right? Uh, jobs are hard, <laughs> you know, and there's a lot of things that are not going to go your way. And you have to learn even more so than in a group project in, in, uh, in a university, how to overcome adversity when things aren't going the right, right away the way you expect them to, right? If people aren't on board with your enthusiasm, your energy and your, you know, need for change, which I can very much relate to, but you know, the reality is not everybody is gonna is gonna jump on that right away. So how do you how do you build resilience in the workplace, a bit of patience with with certain things um, is something that I would say is uh, is something we struggle with a little bit. So I mentioned, right, um, we have, and you talked about it, remote work is important, work life balance is very important, and we're doing a lot to support that. Um, Social life outside of, of work is very important. Um, so for my field, for example, the best experience that I can have somebody go through in the very beginning is that frontline manager, you know, managing a team in a brewery or in logistics, et cetera. That might work, might mean working shift. That's, you know, ah, it's very hard. Who still wants to do that, right? Like, um, that's, that's not... That's counter, counter to everything that we just talked about. So having people understand the, the long term, right, the, the hard work you have to put in in the beginning to then be able to succeed and do incredible jobs uh, later. And by the way, that was still one of the best jobs I ever had, despite the fact that it was really hard, um, you know, is, is something that I think is a challenge for me personally in my area right now. I'm not sure how universities can help with that. Um, I think the best thing is always, um, yeah, more more exposure, more more you know uh, internships or, or I don't know, just yeah, don't yeah, have more touch points with the employers in industry. It seems. I'm sorry. More touch points for the employers in the in the yeah. industry. Yeah, yeah, maybe that's that's a good solution. Yes. Now, we have great engagement in the chat and even talent amongst themselves yeah. there. So a two-part question. We have Emma asking, 
what, in your opinion, is the biggest challenge facing the alcoholic beverage industry? And then related to Emma's question from Amir, what are the difficulties and special measures you must take at ABI being in such an industry? Okay. Um, so I think um, alcohol industry. I can talk for the beer industry. Uh, I struggle to be honest because I, you know, that's really where where I um, where I play a role. Um, I think, interestingly enough, uh, for me as well right now, it comes down to talent, so future talent. Um, so really um, capturing, and and I think it's 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 in two videos that you saw, right? So our consumer base is getting more and more diverse every day, and we have to meet that. We can only do that if our portfolio reflects, you know, our consumers, and if our internal people who drive the the portfolio and drive everything that we do also reflect that diversity. So that's a big piece. Um, for beer as well, you know, a, a big piece that we really need to have to address, like any other, um, like any other company, right, is sustainability, right? Um, so we have beer is made out of natural ingredients, right? So water is like the majority of what we use. We have to grow our grains. We have to grow our hop. Um, so sustainability is a big piece where we have to be a big driver as the biggest brewer for sure, you know, but as an industry as well. Um, what else? Uh, you know, moderate consumption. I think we have a long journey of that. So it might not be top of mind, but you know, from zero to zero, zero, which is a massively growing category. So zero, zero alcohol beers um, to uh, low alcohol beers, um, you know, ensuring that our higher ABV products are consumed responsibly. So I think those are those are big things that we as an industry really have to address. And as a company that leads that industry worldwide, we have a huge portion to play in that. Very good. Now, I know your focus is on Europe. We have a question specific to Africa, so feel free to pass or, or respond. So the question from the audience, is there any specific strategic initiative specific to Africa, not just with respect to product sales and expansion, but actually to impact the continent? Yeah, I think um, so. Sustainability also plays a huge part, no matter where you are, but but Africa as well. And and uh, we do have breweries in Africa that are in water scarce um, areas, right? So, what we've done for our water efforts um, is is really focus um, high energy on those areas where where we have water scarcity. Um, think about Cape Town, right? We have a brewery in Cape Town as an example. Where I was uh, in Los Angeles, California, drought, right? So, so those have been big issues. I think an interesting factor for um, for Africa is the um, supply chain, right? So we do a lot, not just you know, we work with our growers. And uh, what we've done with with Africa is we've really tried to empower female growers, um, give support for for um, financial independence, right? Um, so that they can do cashless transactions with money that stays with them, helping them uh, do better yield through sustainable farming, right? Water intel, I'm going to call it, right? So access to when it rains, so I don't have to water. There's all kinds of different things, but really empowering female farmers, um, because we know that is a, a, it's a given, um, you know, um, good evolution for for the whole community when 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 uh you know there's uh female entrepreneurship um so those are a couple of examples for for africa thank you okay uh, another question from the audience what has been your key or strategy to resilience i talked about resilience um you know what um i think for me personally um mentors again have helped so really people i can voice if I'm frustrated, right, without feeling like there's going to be backlashes or consequences. So having somebody you can trust and just talk about it, <laughs> always getting a different perspective. Um, I've learned over the years um, to put in things in my uh, calendar that allow me to step back. So this was not something I did initially, right, but to step back and actually look, okay, what, what did we achieve? What has changed in, I don't know, three, six 12 months, right? So that I don't get frustrated by a perceived lack of, of, of progress. Um, so, so that's something. Um, 
and then learning getting to know myself better right that journey i think never never ends so for me one of the main ways to recharge is uh actually nature so going on a hike or spending the weekend in the mountains or i love water uh there's nothing better than than going underwater and 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 <laughs> snorkeling and i i've i've learned to dive over the years um so you know regular breaks so i try to really like you know, busy job, but have vacations that are not like six months apart, right? So that's something that um, I really have learned about myself, but everybody has to figure out what works for them. Very nice. Achieving that balance, I agree, is fundamental for one's career. A, yes. a question from the audience, seeing that there seems to be a lot of hands on tasks within the company, what are your takes on robotics taking up these tasks or processes? Uh, okay. Um, the way I think about it, and I see there's questions about industry 4.0 as well, right? So what is industry 4.0, et cetera. So it's basically the digitization of our, our processes, right? In a, so having sensors and machines that can collect data, and then we can look at that data, we can visualize it, and we can, we can do things with that data. In a nutshell, it's a bit more complicated than that, but it's connecting machines with the internet, and getting data and insights to, to be able to act on that. Um, robotics, we're far from that. I think we, we do have, um, you know, um, definitely autom automation. And the way I like to approach automation is think about the task that you want, want to spend eight hours a day doing, right? And, and trying to automate that. And, uh, you know, depending on the level of investment and that varies uh, that we've taken in certain um, breweries, the level of automation or tasks that we still have to do by hand can vary. So um, I think um, that's where I put my emphasis. So and then and this is a huge piece I've, I've, I've talked about within my team. How do we help our frontline team who might still be doing that task evolve to being able to take on higher higher tasks in terms of you know decision making or 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 being able to analyze for example the data that comes out of uh, out of IT and then saying okay i'm seeing certain trends i need to do this now i need to do that now because automate automation doesn't mean we don't need the people behind it to read data and to make decision and, and to help machines become smarter, right? So, um, and that's a huge skill transformation uh, that we have to undergo in our population. It's one of the, the biggest things that I have to, to spend time on. Perfect. Now I've had a chance to see your career over a timeline since 2009. We have a question from Alex as to where you see yourself in five or 10 years. I've always hated that question. It's such a good question. I've always hated it. Um, uh, the what I definitely know is um, working with large teams. So I, I absolutely enjoy that. Um, for me, it's been a tremendous source of growth, and you constantly get a mirror held in front of you. Like you know, you can't escape that. So you constantly have to evaluate how you do things and take feedback. Some of it, you know, not always positive, um, and and evolve. Um, so I will definitely be working with a lot of people. Um, I'm not going to be pinched into one specific position because. Um, that has always allowed me to have all these different roles. Like when somebody offered me the role of internal communications director, when I was in a brewery in LA, I was like, what, you know, <laughs> that was a bit extreme. So not being pegged down into a specific role um, has worked for me, but I certainly still see myself in, in supply chain. So I love that. Um, having stepped out of it, it also, you know, like shows you sometimes how I really, really like it. I love it. Uh, so I, I want to stay in that. In the world of careers, we talk about mapping your career and career objectives. Would you say that you have a plan B in mind or are you not one of those people? Uh, like if, if I, I don't know, if I wouldn't work at, at AB InBev anymore or what do you or mean? As you think about your next career aspirations and those next roles that you would like to take on and how you would like to grow, do you have a backup plan? Do you have a plan B if things don't go the way that you're looking for? Um, yeah, I do. I do. Um, I would, uh, oh God, what, you know, I, I think, um, 
I would try to figure out in, and, and whether that's with, with AB InBev in whatever role or, or, or not, um, which I really don't know, but, um, how to have even more impact. Um, so, you know, driving change is incredibly hard, uh, but it's one of the things that I really enjoy. Um, sustainability is something that I um, take very seriously personally in my personal life as well. So how do I um, how do I extend my impact on that? Um, that would be something that I would pursue, maybe with more education, um, maybe with nonprofit. I don't know, but this would be something that that I would do. Okay. Now a question from the audience: In your view, how resilient is AB InBev organizational resilience in view of the future of work, corporate responsibility? I would say I would I mean look it's tough because as you know right I started here <laughs> and I've only worked at ABI so it's very difficult for me to compare with with other organizations because I just don't have that experience um but I would in a biased way I guess uh rate AB InBev quite high for a company of our size we change extremely quickly um and uh so I think, uh, yeah, I think our resilience is, is very high in that. Um, give you an example again, right? So um, there is on, on DNI, for example, um, that's not an easy topic to tackle. And we've integrated it within two, three years in all of our processes, how we evaluate leaders. You know, what does our CEO do say and the leadership team underneath and underneath? Um, we've done that so fast um, that, you know, that's a, that's a very good example for, for resilience, how we've reacted to COVID. Um, that's been incredibly difficult. And I say, um, you know, we've, we've been a pretty, uh, pretty successful company going through this uh, incredible challenge that we've had to face around the globe. Very good. Now, I want to bring it back to your own career journey and just in benefit of hindsight, would yeah. you have done anything different in your career? Anything different? If anything. Yeah, I yeah. know. Oh, and, and I see, Emma, you've been asking a lot of very good questions. <laughs> Emma keeps popping up. Um, what advice or what would I do differently? Um, no, I think, uh, you know what? Um, there is something that I've reflected on. And, um, you know, I, I'm the first woman in, in our organization in, in Germany to, to do this role. And I was also the first woman at the time to be a frontline manager in, in packaging um, when I started out. This was early in my career. And hindsight is 2020. But I wish I would have taken a different stance in certain situations. Um, I'll give you like stupid jokes, right? Like inappropriate jokes. Um, I would consider myself to having a pretty thick skin. And so for me, it wasn't a big deal. But it shouldn't be a requirement for a woman to have a thick skin, whatever that means, right? To be able to have this role and to be successful in that role. So I could have done a better job paving the way for women who come after me by addressing some of the things that I just kind of let slide. So that would be an example. On the other hand, I was told by another very wise woman, don't be too hard on yourself, right? That is why you grow older and you get more experience. So it's, it's a little bit the, the balance, but this is something that I reflected on recently. Very good. Now, when we finish and we wrap up in the next few minutes, we're going to be encouraging them to head on over to the AB InBev virtual stand and engage with your colleagues. Any advice for them as they go out there and they're engaging with AB InBev and other target employers at the fair and beyond? Be yourself, 100%. That's always the advice that I give. Like If you're trying too hard, it's not going to be a match. It's not, and that doesn't mean that you're not incredibly smart, talented, qualified, right? Like that's, that's not a reflection on you, but finding a match uh, for who you work uh, for is important. Um, it has to fit and you can't make that fit. So don't try to be something you're not, right? Be yourself, 
be confident in who you are. And I think that's, that's always worked for, for, you know, what I've seen successful applicants do is they just showed up being themselves. And, and connected with that from the audience, any specific application or candidate stand out? What makes them stand out in very competitive processes? It's exactly that. Like, you know, when I, for example, talked about our 10 principles, a lot of times what I find with successful candidates, the examples that they bring to questions that they get or, you know, they're naturally an answer to that and not by using the buzzwords or, you know, the descriptors out of the, they just, it's just a natural fit. Um, so, and they're not afraid to, to put themselves out there and also be a bit vulnerable. Um, so that's, that's what I highly value and, and what I find candidates to be uh, successful in the, in the process. Fantastic, wise advice, Maria. What would you hope that our audience has learned from you today? Um, gosh, again, man, those are a lot of tough questions. Um, I hope I was able to convey a little bit who we are. Um, a lot of people don't know AB and Beth. They know our brands, right? Everybody knows a beer that, that we make. Um, so I hope that is definitely a, a takeaway. I hope people have a little bit, uh, you know, whatever I shared out of my own experiences that I wasn't consciously aware of, maybe I, I was able to give them just a little bit of a heads up or a leg up, I think is, is what you call it, right? Um, maybe something resonated and they're able to, to remember that when they are in their first positions or second or third. Um, oh yeah, you know, somebody said that once. Um, that would be something that would really, really be great. Um, I think, yeah, that, that is the answer for this question for me. And, and something that you wish someone had told you at the start of your career? Mm. Believe in yourself, I think. Yes. And the best piece of advice you've ever been given at any stage of your career? That is so tough. I've been giving such good advice for a lot. Um, I think, uh, you know, something, I don't know why it always pops in my head when I get that question is, we do a lot of feedback, as I said, right? And positive and, and improvement feedback. And somebody said to me, spend more time building on your strength because that's what differentiates you from other people. Um, so spend disproportionately more time on your strength than on what you can improve. Unless, and this is a bit of a caveat, you know, the improvement feedback is a career killer. I'll give you an example. So for us, as I said, it's super important to build teams or develop people. If the feedback is on develop people, then, you know, the improvement feedback, then that's maybe something you need to pay attention to. But in general, your strengths are what make you unique, right? And, and what set you apart. So investing time and effort in developing your strength is uh, some of the best advice that I've gotten. Thank you so much, Maria, for this such wise career advice and, of course, life advice. So we thank you for your time and your dedication to the hired community. I want to thank Medina, who's been there in the chat, and all of your colleagues back at the virtual stand, eager to continue engaging with the talent throughout the rest of this final day. So thank you once again, Maria Degener from ABN Bev. It's been such a pleasure to have you at this digital conference. Thank you for the amazing questions. That was really good. My pleasure. Thanks now, so let me just wrap up by explaining what we have coming up the rest of the day. I want to bring your attention to the final CV clinic, which we have happening today from 4 to 5 p.m. CEST. We will be co-hosted by Alba Graduate Business School, Imeris, which is a French company, and two co-hosts from L'Oreal. So if you are interested at all in, in Imeris or L'Oreal, you do not want to miss that session to understand what is it that they're going to be looking for on your CV to advance to that next step of the selection process and what you do not want to have, what you absolutely want to avoid on the CV. So very applicable if you're applying to those organizations, but for any company at all. So please join us from 4 to 5 p.m. CEST. And I want to take this opportunity to thank all of the CV reviewers. You can see them here on the screen that we've had throughout the week. It's been an amazing innovation to bring the recruiter perspective 
combined with the career services professional perspective. And we've really gained so much from that insight. I always say you have seven different individuals for advice, you get seven pieces of advice. And we've had phenomenal keynote speakers, starting with Anka Strauss from UN's International Organization for Migration, followed by yesterday's up close and personal with BBVA. And finally today, Maria Degener from AB InBev. And I want to thank as well our students and graduates from the hired community who have been so engaged throughout with the employers that you're seeing here on the screen and the EFMD schools. It's been more than 100 EFMD schools. And a very special thank you to the hired student ambassadors from our most active schools, which are Cranfield, Edek, Ren, Bocconi, De Montfort, UCD, Michael Smurfett School, and University of Westminster. And of course, to our sponsors, ABNBEV, BBVA, and UN's International Organization for Migration. My name is Amber Wigmore Alvarez, Chief Talent Officer, and a very special thank you to our entire hired community and the hired team for making these fairs a reality. We thank you and look forward to continued engagement from our students and graduates of hired. Thank you very much.